Hello, everyone, and welcome to AGO From Home Facebook Live chat. Today, my name is Audrey Hudson. I am the Associate Curator of Schools and Early Childhood Programs, and today I am joined by uh, artist Sunny Asu and Associate Curator of Indigenous Art at the AGO, Wanda Nanabush. I'm, I'm going to start with Indigenous Art at the AGO. <laughs> <laughs> yes? <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we are in these virtual times and thank you for joining us. Uh, I will do, I want to do an, a land acknowledgement on where the, the ground the AGO is on. Uh, it is the home of the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, and it has been the home of the uh, Haudenosaunee and the Huron uh, First Nations. And it is and continues to be the uh, the the grounds and the land of Indigenous people from time immemorial. So I'd like to go and do a little bit of a deeper introduction or uh, allow uh, other guests to do a deeper introduction on who they are and uh, and where they are. Okay, over to you, uh, maybe Wanda. Hi everybody, nice to see you. Um, I am want to explain like where the work is and how we brought it into the Art Gallery of Ontario, into the collection. We are really excited to bring Sunny's work. This is the first work to come into the collection. It won't be the last. Uh, we have a, on the first floor of the Art Gallery of Ontario, one of the first rooms you will come into is the Fudger Rotunda. And this room leads you into the European uh, collection. So it's a really important moment to look at what we have there is a kind of collection of Canadian landscapes. And in the center of the room, we brought in uh, Adrian Stimson's work, Old Sun, which really looks at the history of residential schools. And then at the entry to the European, on one side you have Emily Carr's uh, church at Euquat Sound or Indian church from 1929. And then on the other side, you have the, the mirror appropriated and intervened upon image done by Sunny Asu. So it's beautiful because you can kind of see the oscillation between these two works. It's really important, I think, to have these all these other stories in that space because of this history of landscapes being empty, giving the idea that Indigenous folk weren't here, First Nations people weren't on the land. It kind of lends to this terra, terra nullius idea and so Sonny's work is really, really smart in terms of how he appropriates the painting and how he intervenes with the youth, the oiboids, the S forms and the U forms. Um, and I'd like to turn it to Sonny in a second for him to talk about exactly what is happening in this work. I know you're playing with tags and also there's a bit of a sci-fi kind of thing in the reinvaders. Um, an underlying kind of feeling of like, who is the invader and who, who, is the, who is the alien here? Do you want to talk a bit about where this work comes from? Yeah, well, I think uh, the work, oh, hello? We're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're good. <laughs> I, I heard my name again and I'm like, what's happening? Um, yeah, so sorry, the, um, yeah, the work uh, really does touch on a lot of those things you spoke of, Wanda. Um, what this, what this, the series really came out of was kind of challenging um, the under, or the misunderstanding that Canada was kind of like this uninhabited, untamed, wild wilderness before um, European uh, colonists and settlers came over here, um, and a lot of the work from uh, landscape work from this area, uh, specifically with around the Group of Seven, um, is devoid of Indigenous presence. And this series really kind of came out of that, um, uh, came out of that kind of ethos of, of kind of challenging um, the lack of a presence in uh, a lot of these landscape paintings from that era. Where Emily Carr was different, you know, she wasn't really associated with the group she was associated with the group of seven but not like really a, embraced by it um or a member if you want to call it that um mm -hmm. she worked with a lot of people within um that circle but she was never really fully embraced for uh reasons that you know could be attributed to because she was a woman a woman painter and uh she was kind of ahead of the 
the, the times uh, for the, what she was doing. Um, but in what Emily Carr was doing was she was actually painting, um, she was painting an indigenous presence on the landscape, but if you look at it in a certain light, it almost seems like some of the paintings are still devoid of an indigenous presence, like um, uh, where there isn't actually any people. So th it almost looks like there is, um, uh, it's almost depicting this kind of vanishing race. Um, and I think when I first started looking at Emily Carr's work, I really kind of embraced that notion that she was depicting a vanishing race and reading mm -hmm. um, Marcia Crosby's uh, essay, Construction of an Imaginary Indian, um, mm -hmm. and kind of um, being inspired by that. And what I really wanted to do um, with this series is I wanted to kind of re, um, uh, I wanted to place um, the indigenous presence on these landscapes to say that we were there and we still are here. Um, and so a lot of the, the, the images I was placing over top in these digital interventions um, are, uh, are, like you said, ovoids, S-forms, U-shapes, uh, all kind of ar around this uh, conversation uh, through form line on the Northwest Coast. Um, and what I wanted to do there is I wanted to kind of use them as tags to kind of put them on top of these Emily Carr paintings to say that we are here, we were never mm -hmm. gone. Um, and in a way, I was kind of embraced, not that I'm a, a graffiti writer, um, but I do appreciate the art form um, and a lot of the uh, conversations that graffiti does bring to the public. As I wanted to kind of, um, and I'll kind of explain why this was bad and get into how I've changed it in, in, in the future with newer works, um, as I wanted to kind of place disc tags on top of Emily Carr's paintings in a way, um, as I wanted to kind of, you know, say that what she was doing is wrong. So I'm putting my own um, style mm. of work on top of it. Um, later, I found out um, through developing the series um, more in depth for my exhibit at the Vancouver Art Gallery um, called We Come to Witness, which was in, uh, in um, dialogue with Emily Carr's work from their collection, mm -hmm. um, as I discovered that through talking with Ian Tom and other people uh, and even Marcia Crosby um, that uh, Emily Carr wasn't really depicting the vanishing race. She was really just painting what she had seen um, and kind of discovering more about her is that she was really welcomed by a lot of the the various indigenous nations along the Pacific Northwest coast. Um, and she really just wanted to paint what she had seen, um, going through some of her readings and discovering that she was fully embraced um, by a lot of the local um, indigenous peoples. Um, she was given a name, Kliwik, um, by some Nichano peoples. Mm -hmm. um, so what I discovered is she was very aware uh, of the people and the presence of the landscape. And that really changed my opinion of that she wasn't painting this vanishing race, it's how we perceive it. Um, that because it is devoid of an indigenous presence as, as in people, um, that this must be like a, you know, a, a painting of a ruin mm -hmm. to say. Um, so if you kind of take a look at the bottom corners of, um, of these works from the series, you'll kind of notice like there's either two or a single ovoid kind of down in the corner. And in the earlier works, they were solid ovoids and those were um, covering up uh, her signature. And that mm -hmm. was what I really saw as the disc tag. Um, but as the mm -hmm. work progressed and going into um, that exhibit, um, uh, we call We Come the Witness, um, I started using hollow ovoids to kind of make them more of mm -hmm. a uh, post-humorous collaboration, I guess you could say, um, because, you know, I wasn't really aiming to um, disrespect what Carr was doing, is I really just wanted to change, pe change how people perceive these works. Um, and then with that later kind of iteration of making these hollow old boys, I really wanted people to understand that, um, you know, there's just a way of, of changing how we view the work. I think there, yeah. Okay, there's thank you a, for that. And another, oh, can I say something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead, and then I'll follow. 
Okay, my connection seems to be a little wonky. Sorry about that. Um, I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, how works change in their context and new meanings can be given to this work. And I think in this context, thinking about the church, you know, this is a very big white church in the center. Um, and, you know, there is, she has this love of the forest and like feeding that kind of nature as this spiritual place mm. is still part of an erasure narrative, um, even mm -hmm. if even if it's not an empty landscape, nonetheless, and she knew we were there. I think there is this desire for us in our pastness, in our spiritualness, in our, you know, that kind of thing is still in this piece. Mm -hmm. There's also this interaction between the, the forms, the presencing, and the church, right? And it's like mm -hmm. years of banning of our culture and all that kind of thing that the church can come to represent. No, for sure. Yeah, that's definitely, hmm. that's definitely within it as well. And that's, you know, that's where these forms kind of, um, they sit on top of these, these paintings of Carr and um, yeah. I was gonna go into some more a... details about the work if you want or but. Going yes. <laughs> and I'm just, uh, <laughs> um, I just wanted to, uh, to share that, uh, yeah, so this is, this is the focus of um, one of our teacher resources that we've launched. Uh, they are live on the website and they're also available in the link. Um, so this teacher resource talks about, yes, uh, your work, Sunny. And then also the curriculum, I just wanna make the curriculum links uh, quite evident. So of course, history, uh, social sciences, uh, science and design, uh, elements of design. Uh, and this is geared towards grade seven to 12. So thinking about what they're doing in their classroom or and virtually right now, uh, and then how teachers can uh, entry points for teachers. And I think we've given them uh, some entry points uh, already, uh, thinking about uh, form lines, thinking about presencing, thinking about indigeneity on land in different places, and thinking about how this artist, Emily Carr, has worked within her surroundings, and then how Sunny, you've uh, um, initiated and or made more present uh, indigenous uh, uh, peoples on this land. Can you tell, I, I, I would, yes, of course, I'd like you to go into a little bit deep, more deeper into the work, but I also, I'm really curious about your, you, you talked a little bit about tagging, about graffiti, but what is your influence from hip hop, like the music and I guess the culture on your work? Yeah, well, um, I think I, I think music in general plays a really big part of my practice and it's it's really important that there is some kind of audio happening uh, in my mm -hmm. studio as I'm working. Um, mm. I, I do, I appreciate a lot of different genres, but definitely um, hip hop is a big um, presence in my studio. Um, it's just something that I really enjoy working to. Mm. Um, yeah, was there like a specific question around like hip hop and how it influences the, the work? possibly or yeah be, just because yeah because of one of one of the elements of hip-hop is uh graffiti it is that element of the visual aspect of uh of hip-hop and so and that's very i don't know it's quite evident in your work and you've spoken about it um mm -hmm. so i just wanted to bring that up because i think that's an edging point as well into classrooms with young people um yeah. that are interested in um yeah in in culture, in uh, hip hop culture and, uh, and otherwise, so. Right, well, I think, yeah. um, you. you know, for me, uh, hip hop, and I think even now has become, um, I think it's becoming the dominant form of musical pop culture, where mm -hmm. when I was a youth, the dominant form was uh, rock. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel uh, connected to both. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting about hip hop is it has such a, a a dynamic roots into indigeneity where you have mm -hmm. a lot of indigenous peoples from all over North America um, embracing hip hop and utilizing mm -hmm. it as, as a tool to speak out uh, against their own oppression, um, which is uh, one of the roots of hip hop where it was taken from um, uh, uh, black culture and speaking of, uh, you know, a way for people to work out of their own um, uh, oppressions in, in, in that regard. So mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to see those parallels between uh, Native American culture and Black culture and how mm -hmm. um, those lines um, are, are very thin and often blurred. Um, 
so yeah, uh, hip hop for me mm-hmm. is just it's it's just something that's that invigorates my work and invigorates the presence. Um, it's a, it's a way to mm-hmm. get um, energized to making mm-hmm. these specific pieces. Great, thank you. A long history of resistance in all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The roots mm-hmm. of hip hop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think you know when you when you talk about this work and we think about pop culture, because you know I grew up in a in an era where um, pop culture for me was, um, you know, it was the '80s and '90s, so I was very uh, in tune with that aesthetic. But I was also, um, you know, back then I was into you know. I don't want to call it counterculture because that that really makes it something different. But you know, back then. Uh, comic books and video games were kind of a nerdy pursuit and I was I was knee deep and all that stuff um, and so a lot of the color palette that I, that I use within this series definitely kind of um, utilizes um, that ethos um, but also mm-hmm. through pop culture comic books and video games um, this one specifically um, it's kind of riffing on um, Space Invaders mm-hmm. the video game um, yeah. where I'm kind of talking about <laughs> You know, there's this 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 conversation around aliens and, and an alien mm. encounter where we have, um, you know, we, we fantasize through um, through movies and TV and comics and radio, um, you know, this this alien invasion and how we mm-hmm. mostly white North America will step up and say, hey, we're going to fight this and we're going to kick out these aliens, um, which becomes a really interesting and iron- ironic dynamic to think about when you take a look at how um, what we know now is North America was was colonized by an alien invasion. <laughs> um, and a lot of the kind of um, uh, conversations I like to have around um, uh, aliens in general around this is a lot of this work was also inspired and in, in thinking of later in the series um, and where I really embraced sci-fi and alien encounters um, where I was also inspired by the petroglyph markings um, mm. left by my ancestors around our um, mm. our, tr- our traditional village site, which is a little bit further away from where I'm living now. Mm. Um, so all these petroglyphs are there and there's faces and heads and mm. there's you know one of a person looks like they're waving. Uh, but what I found interesting about these petroglyphs, oh. petroglyphs is that um, they always have like elongated heads or weirdly shaped heads. And so I kind of saw them as almost alien in a way. And a lot of the the later works in the series where I do embrace sci-fi um, through these, as I was really kind of thinking about, um, you know, what if, uh, or maybe, um, you know, other worldly visitors had come down and uh, spoken mm. to um, our ancestors on mm. various levels. Because you, you do see petroglyphs all over, um, uh, not even indigeneity through North America, but through, you know, Australia and, um, uh, in New Zealand, all kind of in all those places, you you do see these things. So it's it's kind of interesting to see these conversations that are spread out through our very kind of small globe, um, but has how it has a bigger impact on how we think about the the world in a bigger place as a bigger place. Great, thank you. So it is actually uh, so Wanda. Maybe we have uh, time for one more question. Um, if you want to, if you would like to uh, uh, post to Sunny, or we could, you could just keep talking about your work. <laughs> um, I have one more question. Okay, okay, go I ahead. Make sure there was no audience that was asking questions. Yeah, um, no. I'm also interested in, as, a, as an artist, uh, when you're beginning, you have this long tradition of West Coast imagery that's sort of in design that is uh, very popular <laughs> with collectors, museums, mm. you know, it's got a long history. Um, with museums, um, how are you as an artist, think of yourself as engaging that because you're, you're definitely engaging it, but also innovating and shifting and how do you make room for yourself within that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, I mean, what I'd like specifically about um, this work being at the AGO is it gets to be paired alongside of the 
original object, mm. the original painting um, of Emily Carr. And so, you know, it, it's interesting to see those two works together. And I saw a photo someone had sent me when they visited the AGO of, um, of them side by side on the other side of the mm. door. And there's this woman kind of walking through the shot and it almost looked like she had stopped to do like this double take of, you know, what's, <laughs> what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about this work and my work, um, you know, being in these collections is, um, in a way, some of them do subvert the narrative um, of how and how Indigenous artwork is collected and how it was collected and how artists like myself can definitely make that space and take that space to present um, authentic uh, ways of, of, of making and producing, especially when you take a look, uh, a look at, um, you know, um, collections, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, the Field Museum, uh, where they have a very large co collection of Northwest Coast objects, but they were taking, they were taken at a time in our history when uh, it was illegal for uh, Indigenous cultures all over, or all over Canada um, to be practicing their spirituality, to practice mm -hmm. their ceremonies. Um, you know, what was known, uh, known as the potlatch ban. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my ancestral objects were taken um, mm -hmm. from various family members um, and, and sold off uh, either right from the, the, you know, right from the Indian agents or on the black market um, and sold off to these museums. And you have them and they almost seem like they're static and mm -hmm. they, they're, they're frozen in a moment of time. Um, I had the opportunity to visit a collection um, in the UK this past summer um, where I went and did a residency at the Sainsbury Centre in Norwich and um, I was able to produce a show while I was there, um, a solo show where I was looking specifically at their collection and, and making work in response to it. Um, what was fun about that show is I went in with a specific mindset of, okay, I'm going to make, um, you know, a chill cat inspired painting because they have a chill cat mm -hmm. there. And I'm going to take out all these um, objects that have been uh, collected. Uh, and a lot of them have uh, little to no provenance behind them. So they don't really know where they come from mm -hmm. and then have this whole big conversation. Um, and that did become mm -hmm. part of, of the exhibit that I, that I ended up making, but I also paired it up with um, their, some of their works from uh, Francis Bacon um, because they, they were a big supporter of his. And so it was interesting to see this kind of dynamic of having someone like Francis Bacon, who was like this big um, uh, Western art name, uh, you know, alongside these unnamed objects and people, mm. you know, unnamed, and the show was called Unnamed Maker um, because mm. a lot of these objects that were made didn't have any um, attribution to them, to who made them. Um, and that's the biggest thing for me. That's, that's how it becomes this, this moment of reflection and sorrow because I could see that ancestral object, but I have no idea who made it mm. and I have no idea what its intended purpose might have been um, or who owned it or what it was, mm. what it was, what the use was for. And so what I find interesting about doing a show like that is that it gives the opportunity for Indigenous artists to go in there and challenge um, the mm. institution uh, on it as a whole. Um, yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so our time, uh, our time is up. But uh, I would like to say, I will just go through um, uh, the last couple slides. So teachers out there, uh, how do we engage? I think we've given you a lot. This is a really, uh, really special moment um, having an artist here with us on this talk, um, actually speaking first person about uh, their artwork. So I think you can use a lot of what uh, Sunny has, uh, has given, has provided. And then uh, this was a project uh, that we came up with, the team at the AGO came up with, uh, Sunny, uh, uh, in, in, uh, as an influence or taking influence from your work. It's called Project Reinventing. Cool. Uh, so thinking about the AGO's collection. Yeah, <laughs> uh, thinking about the AGO's collection. And we're basically asking students uh, uh, to look at what you've done and to kind of 
create their own tag or create their own cultural specificity uh, onto a piece of work from the AGO's collection. So uh, teachers or anyone, if yeah, <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, so we're hoping that folks will engage with this and please hashtag it AGO from, uh, from home uh, so we can see what you're creating and, and share back with you. Uh, otherwise, that is, I will say goodbye and then I'll let, um, and then I'll invite everyone else to say goodbye. So thank you for joining us. Uh, see you again on another Wednesday to your talk. Thanks, Benny. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me. It was, it was a blast. Good to <laughs> thank see you. Everybody. And Sunny, hold on a like moment. Little, like spaceship Sunny. UFO blast. <laughs> right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> and Sunny, can you, sorry, um, can you tell us exactly where you are? Oh yeah, I'm, uh, I'm at home. I'm yeah. in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm at home. Uh, I live in um, unceded Liquita territory, the home mm -hmm. of my ancestors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm living within my community uh, on the reserve here in uh, what is now known as Campbell River, BC. Great, thank you. Um, and we will post a link uh, to uh, to Sunny's website uh, within the comments. And we will, uh, if there are any questions, we can uh, look at them uh, afterwards. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. 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 Bye.